Okay, so hi everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being interested in OpenSUSE. Uh, I'm here uh, to tell you how OpenSUSE evolved uh, mainly last year, but we were working on it uh, for quite some time. Well, for quite, a, quite some time we were getting into this direction and uh, now quite some stuff changed. Uh, my name is uh, Michal Hushetsky. I'm an uh, uh, OpenSUSE contributor and I'm also a member of OpenSUSE board. I would uh, like to start with uh, what actually is OpenSUSE as a project. Just a reminder that uh, we are not uh, just a Linux distribution. We do a Linux distribution, but uh, yeah, sorry. I should have turned my Wi-Fi off, damn it. Ah. And now nobody will bother us again. Ah, okay. Uh, our main goal as an open source project is promote uh, use of Linux everywhere. And we are doing distribution, as I said, but we are also doing uh, quite some tools around the distribution, not just the distribution. Here's a list of some of the projects that uh, are part of OpenSUSE project in general terms. You might have heard of some of them, might not. Uh, quite some of them are interesting and we will be talking about some of them a little bit more in details later on. So, uh, every Linux distribution out there is facing uh, similar forces that are trying to rip it apart. And uh, those forces are mainly uh, two main ones. There is people that would like to have uh, more really new stuff that are looking for newest and greatest. And there are people that are looking for stable distribution. And these two forces are actually going against each other in most cases. We have somebody like uh, some bleeding edge crazies. These guys uh, don't like uh, software that was released months ago because it's too old and boring, and uh, everybody has it, but they want the stuff that was released yesterday, because they want to be the first to run it, and discover what's new, and they care about new features. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't bother them that much, because, yeah, tomorrow there is a new release, so it might work better tomorrow, and might break something else, but never mind, there is still tomorrow. Uh, they are really excited about every update that is out there and for them the only viable solution is rolling release because uh, yeah, everything else is too old and boring and for my grandpa and stuff like that. So they don't care about small issues as long as they are able to update to the newer stuff and get some fixes. That's one side of the spectrum. On the other hand, we have some, these boring grandpas that uh, really hate new stuff. They want the stuff the way it used to be when they were young and don't like any changes and uh, want to install a system and don't touch it and uh, you just get some small bug fixes, but no new features, no change in behavior, really something that I can depend on for years and don't have to learn anything new and uh, everything will work always the same. And yeah, <laughs> well, some people call it production, some people run rolling releases in production. Uh, it's called Agile nowadays. <laughs> you deploy as soon as you have something that builds. 
and it's modern way of thinking. <laughs> so yeah, we have these two guys that, uh, well, two types of guys that want completely opposite things. And uh, distribution for everybody has to address both of them. One of them wants to uh, recycle basically every other day, ideally two releases every day or something like that. And the other guys uh, want really so well, once in few years at tops. So how to deal with it? Uh, we dealt with it uh, by creating two different distributions. <laughs> we let them rip us apart and we have two distributions that work together and uh, that address both issues. One of them is called OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. It's our rolling distribution, always changing, always fun, always, uh, always new features, always new bugs, and always fixing bugs that was there yesterday by adding uh, different bugs. So, a little bit of history. It was started a uh, long time ago by, uh, by Greg uh, Kroa Hartmann. It was uh, meant to be a rolling distribution that was kind of stable. And initially it was just add-on repo on the stable distribution. So we had a stable distribution and then we had a add-on repo where Greg uh, cherry-picked uh, changes from our development version, uh, which he's kind of expected to be stable. He put, put them there and uh, we got something that was kind of stable, but uh, every time we released a new distribution, there was kind of big leap in the stuff that wasn't cherry picked yet. Later on, we introduced uh, some changes to our development model of uh, OpenSUSE Factory, which is the development version that made it quite stable and actually made it more stable than the old Tumbleweed. And uh, in November 4th, uh, 2014, old Tumbleweed was replaced by this uh, new model of development. So how did it became more stable? Uh, we extensively use some of the tools that I mentioned in the beginning. It can work only thanks to open build service and open QA. What are those? Uh, just a side question. Uh, who is here open to say user? Okay, not many. So the rest of you probably don't know these tools. So let me briefly introduce them. OBS or Open Build Service is open source built server. It's focused mainly on packaging, so it can do, it can basically build packages, but uh, it tracks all the dependencies. Uh, when you change, for example, OpenSSL, it will trigger rebuilds of everything that depends on OpenSSL to make sure that uh, API and ABI works together uh, and it publishes only some uh, coherent uh, repositories. It understands what repositories are, how to publish them, and uh, although it is part of open source ecosystem, it uh, doesn't work only with RPMs. It can also create uh, Debian packages, it can create uh, packages for Arc Linux. It can uh, create ISOs, tarballs of root file systems, and uh, some other stuff that I don't even know about. And it's quite extensible. So if you are running some weird Linux distribution that we don't have support for yet, it's uh, quite easy to add support for new distribution you just need to implement how to write 
recipes for your packaging and how to export some dependencies so it can work with it. It uh, supports, uh, basically you have a server that uh, directs everything and then you have a bunch of build nodes that actually build stuff. It has a web interface, it has a CLI tool, and if you want to know more, there's a link that you can use and uh, learn more. I can try to... Yep, I turned off Wi-Fi, so... I wanted to show it, but then... This is my Android netbook, so there will be plenty of notification popping up. Maybe uh, at the end of the presentation, I will turn on the Wi-Fi and show you how it looks in, uh, in real life. So OBS is one thing. It uh, constantly builds our packages, allows us to create plenty of repositories, and uh, publishes packages for us, and makes it really easy to handle thousands and tens of thousands of packages constantly building, rebuilding, flowing in multiple directions. Everything constantly rebuilding and changing. Great for factory or tumbleweed. Then we have OpenQA. That's uh, some kind of generic testing tool, but it's uh, mostly focused on testing of operating systems. Uh, typical usage, how we use it is uh, it starts VM and uh, it pushes some input into the VM, it tracks the output, looks at the screens, takes the screenshots and tries to matches, uh, try to find some patterns in the screenshots and then decides whether it works or not. You can use uh, serial console to push in some commands, and uh, it can compare just parts of the screen, so it can look for something. Uh, if you don't know where the window will pop up in your window manager, you can try to search for it. And uh, we have, for example, whole installation process of OpenSUSE scripted in this tool. So whenever we change anything, this tool will run the installation process for every possible com configuration of the installation and we, uh, we are making sure that installation works, whether you select KD, GNOME, software rate, uh, encrypted hard drive, or whatever. And uh, you can also make uh, some fuzzy comparison, so if you want, uh, it doesn't matter that much if font changes, but if you like, uh, it can be pretty strict. And uh, it's actually nowadays not used only by us, but uh, our colleagues at Fedora are using it nowadays as well. And uh, it can uh, test not only OpenSUSE, but uh, I know that there were some proof of concept of testing, uh, for example, Android. And I think somebody even tried uh, running Windows in there. So these two tools are really great. We have something to test the distribution and make sure that it works. And we have something that can build plenty of packages and make repositories and basically create distribution. So. Let's put it together and we get a uh, great tumbleweed. Uh, so how was uh, Factory developed? Basically, uh, as I was saying that we have all these repositories that can be do done in OBS pretty easily. Uh, we had OpenSUSE Factory and uh, we had uh, some package then uh, that package always had some develop project where changes get submitted. When uh, maintainers of the uh, develop project or the package agreed to the changes, you can imagine it like a pull request on GitHub. So they accepted the changes and pushed them to factory. Then 
it got through some levels of review and ended up in factory. And then it broke something completely unrelated. And we had to fix it. So that was the way how factory used to be broken quite often. And uh, yeah, if you are uh, looking for rolling distribution, you don't mind if there are some small bugs, if you get updates quite often and bugs get fixed. But if we push, for example, new GCC and it breaks half of the distribution and we cannot uh, release anything in a month, then you are not that happy. So we changed this process to something a little bit more complicated. Uh, yeah, this, uh, there's, uh, from a contributor's point of view, it's still mostly the same. Uh, you still have your package that you branched and you still submit it to the develop project. But uh, when developer from developer project submits it to factory, it doesn't go directly to the developer, uh, to the factory. It ends up uh, in uh, some staging project before where we try to build this package and packages that depends on it from factory also, so we can discover the potential building issues. Well, we find out whether it builds, but uh, building it is not enough. So uh, when it builds, we submit it to OpenQA for some testing to see whether it actually also runs and works. And only when it passes, then we merge it to factory. If it uh, doesn't pass, uh, you have to fix, uh, somebody has to fix uh, what's broken there. And only after that, it gets merged. So for example, if there is a new GCC, it ends up in staging project for quite a long time till everything is prepared for release. And in the meantime, we get some fixes. Yeah? How do updates work while everything is in the staging process? Are uh, securing the updates for, for unrelated packages? Uh, how security uh, updates work? Uh, yeah. Uh, question was, uh, how do we update packages uh, of unrelated projects? There is not only one staging project. There is multiple staging projects. So you can still send updates for packages that are not this package that broke everything. And uh, when this change gets uh, merged into factory, then uh, factory gets rebuilt, published. But before it goes to the users, just to make sure we run it through OpenQA again, do more testing to make sure that everything works, and then we release it. So it's a pretty complicated process, but uh, luckily for us, most of the stuff is done by computers. So it's just some electricity going on somewhere. So some numbers. Uh, when we started with Tumbleweed, it was uh, quite popular. Then uh, his, its popularity kind of decreased. Then we changed the factory. It got stable and people started to like it and migrate to new factory because we got a rolling distribution that is really fast rolling, but uh, still quite stable thanks to our tooling that we have. So we don't break stuff that often. And even if we do, we don't break it uh, we don't break the major stuff because for major stuff we have uh, test cases in OpenQA. Some uh, quiet week for our rolling, dis rolling distributions. We release three times a week. We change the kernel and 146 packages. That's quite a boring week. Uh, Normal week is something like this, five releases, two kernels, and 300 packages. 
yeah, if you want to see busy week, uh, take a look when uh, we update KDE or GNOME, then or Tech Life, then there is thousands of packages <laughs> updated and changed. So yeah, this uh, solves part of the problem. We got uh, Tumbleweed to cover all these bleeding edge crazies. But uh, what about people who, uh, who want uh, the old production systems? Old boring production systems. So what, what do these guys actually want? They want a long release cycle, long support, good maintenance. They are not after the newest and the greatest. They are after stability and they still want quite some packages. So luckily for us, we have a SUSE that helped us in that regard because they actually do distribution for this boring kind of guys. They have a SUSE Linux Enterprise that is for people that don't want to update and are conservative and stuff like that. So they released the uh, sources of SUSE Linux Enterprise including all patches and including all security updates. And uh, we could do some kind of slant OS or something like that with that, but we decided to do something completely different, something uh, better, we hope. And uh, because we want uh, more packages than SLE, SLE is uh, focused really for on uh, companies, so, set of packages is limited to what they require and because the support is really long it's not feasible to support everything and these enterprise customers don't care about uh, KDE Plasma but they care about storage and databases and this stuff that is not that visible. So we can help each other they can provide us with some stable code base. Uh, we are going to build on top of it some new packages. We are going to take stuff from upstream and improve it. And we can both win. So we have uh, Tumbleweed, which has uh, plenty of packages rolling. Then we have OpenSUSE Leap that uh, has uh, some thousands of packages as well. But uh, it has a shared core with SUSE Linux Enterprise. And this shared core is uh, yeah, shared between Leap and SUSE Linux Enterprise. And SUSE Linux Enterprise has some specific packages on top of it that are really targeting uh, enterprise customers like SAP and whatever. So we have this open source Tumbleweed that is rolling and uh, we are taking uh, changes from open source Tumbleweed into our stable distributions. Uh, for example, KDE, sometimes GNOME, uh, this stuff ends up in open source Tumbleweed as soon as they are released. From time to time, we want to pick something and put it into our stable distribution. And then it becomes part of the shared core that we share with SLE. Sometimes if it is something that SLE doesn't care, it just lives in Leap. And we go on and on and on and on. Uh, we started with this, uh, with uh, Leap 42.1, which was our first uh, new release. Uh, we had OpenSUSE 13.2, uh, and then we started doing new distribution, and we call it OpenSUSE Leap, and we started with uh, number 42.1, because we like 42. Anybody knows what 42 is? Yeah, the answer to the old questions. 
And uh, actually, we have quite history with this number because first uh, SUSE, SUSE distribution that was actually own distribution done by SUSE was 4.2. And first the YAST version, which is our graphical configuration tool, was uh, 0 0.42. So we have, we have quite a habit of starting with 42. And it actually makes sense in this case because we were basing it on the same shared core that has a slit valve. So uh, it nicely corresponds because lib version is SLI version plus 30. So you can figure out which SLI we are based on. So what will happen when there will be SLI 13? Well, uh, at that point, we will create new shared core that, is, that will be based on OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. And on this shared core, we will develop both SLE 13 and LEAP 43.0. And from then on, we will be still getting uh, cherry picking some updates from Tumbleweed and uh, rolling forward as uh, suggested here updating the core slightly, but just little by little, no big changes, nothing uh, that will scare people off, keeping things stable and boring for everybody. So what we ended up with, we have a recycle based on Sliban, which is pretty conservative. It's about uh, one year to the service pack. So you have one year where there are just bug fixes and then there is just small changes. So nothing really scary. You have long support over three years. We have a well-maintained and stable core, which is kernel, glibc and stuff like that. So if you are running server, then your core packages are stable and we can still do crazy stuff with uh, leaf packages, like your favorite uh, minority uh, text editor. We can update it in OpenSUSE Leap uh, every, every service pack without actually breaking uh, stability of the whole system. So you get uh, newer and uh, better packages for the stuff that is not that important, but the important stuff stays stable. First release uh, was uh, last year in uh, November 2015, and currently we are, I think, in beta, right? Yeah. We are about to enter beta phase for 42.2, which is just a little incremental update on top of 42.1. So instead of uh, making one distribution for everybody, we split it into two distributions that uh, match our two groups in target audience much better. Well, we did also some other changes. We found out that nobody is using uh, 32 bits and uh, pretty much nobody was using live CDs. So with introduction of Leap, we basically dropped support for 32 bits and live CDs as long as nobody picks it up. And uh, since we were shaking things up, uh, we did also something else. Uh, we deployed uh, some translation tool. This is a generic translation tool. It's called WebLate. It's a web-based translation, but uh, it's running on top of Git, and you can use just Git. You don't have to use web, but it's uh, nice and easy because uh, end users can submit suggestions for translations 
and translators can just pick them up. So hopefully we will get better translated uh, distribution and everything goes back directly to the Git. So again, another tool that helps us uh, well, eliminate um, barriers of entry and uh, makes it easier for people to contribute to OpenSUSE. So that's uh, all I have on slides. Uh, I can ask you for your questions and I will turn on Wi-Fi and show you the websites that I was talking on. So we can start by questions if you have any. No questions? Okay, let's turn on Wi-Fi and see what what pops up. Where? Sorry? Yeah. Okay. Um, so OpenQA sounds, no, I have no or seeing OpenQA for the stuff, but I'm also kind of um, working a lot on client automated deploys so of public configuration that is kind of deployed and continuous client. So OpenQA also looks like a nice way to integrate in a setup like that, where you test your deployed configuration for clients. Have you ever seen something like that being used? Okay, so question is, uh, question is uh, that there are, uh, if you have, uh, if you are deploying quite some changes, using uh, stuff like Puppet, Chef, and Ansible, and whatnot, whether it, whether we saw somebody using OpenQA to test those changes. I haven't seen personally. It might be possible to use it, but uh, the main idea behind the OpenQA is that uh, uh, you get to test the user interface the user is facing. And mostly the stuff that you are talking about, uh, this uh, system management stuff, uh, you are configuring stuff that is uh, not that user visible. Mostly it's uh, much easier to test it without uh, graphical user interface and to test it uh, by doing some unit testing. The, the main uh, issue we were trying to address with OpenQA is that uh, you cannot unit test that uh, user interface for LibreOffice is working. Or you can, but not that easily. Or it's really hard to test that you can install distribution and grab works after installer ended up. So yeah, probably it can be used. But uh, I think you can do it easier with uh, tests uh, tailored to your services because mostly those uh, uh, mostly you are deploying some service that has some API or something. Oh, you are de you are deploying desktop machines. Okay, then then it uh, then uh, this tool might help you. So, uh, let's start by OpenQA. Okay, so this is uh, how the page looks like. Uh, we have uh, results of some tests. Some are failing, some are soft failing, some are passing. And uh, if we Take a look at, I don't know what. Let's take a look here. We can see that uh, test results are not just one thing, but uh, there's multiple stuff that was tested. We can see what was working, what was not working. And yeah, if we take a detailed look, we can see the series of screenshots documenting what was going on and what was uh, the green one were passing and uh, orange one was soft passing. We can take a closer look and here is, uh, that doesn't work on touch screen. 
But uh, in general, there is this yellow line that you can drag to the left or to the right, and you can see what's the difference between uh, the real result and uh, the wrong result. In this case, uh, there is a blue rectangle. That blue rectangle is something that we were looking for, and in this case, didn't really match up. This is a serial, but uh, yeah. Oh, this one? Yep. We were looking uh, whether Grab works, whether it displays uh, OpenSSL logo somewhere, and whether we have a uh, progress bar in there. So OpenQA is taking a series of screenshots and looking for stuff in those screenshots. And the interesting part, it documents. Uh, there is also a video of whole installation process. So you can take a look at how installation is done as a side effect of doing tests for the installation. Now, this is how OBS looks like. Uh, it's quite busy, as you can see. And uh, we have uh, plenty of projects. Uh, all packages are divided into projects. Uh, there are submit requests that can go between tho those projects. Some of, one of those projects is open SUSE factory. You can see some staging projects. Uh, there is a nice web interface for managing all these packages, but mostly if you are a developer, you get really, you can get really fast accustomed to the CLI stuff. It works basically like SVN or Git. It has uh, its own version control system where you just commit changes to the packages, it builds, it gets published, you test it, you submit it somewhere. And WebLate, I will show you the upstream one. And yeah, it's basically website translation tool where you can see uh, Languages makes a suggestion and changes goes directly into the Git that is in the backend. So developers doesn't have any overhead with managing translations somewhere in some tool. It runs directly on top of their Git tree. Okay, so some more questions. Now that you see some pictures, I think nothing. Okay, uh, what were we using for translation before web life? Yeah, we had some SVN tree where we had to export our strings to. Then our translators uh, did whatever they wanted with those strings. Some of them downloaded it and mailed it back. And uh, some of them committed it directly. But uh, it still required somebody to export the strings to the tool. Well, in our case, SVN repository and merge changes back. So nowadays we are just running tool that can work on top of our git tree. That kind of simplifies the stuff and eliminates the need for the somebody to merge it there and back and makes just translators responsible for that. Uh, yeah, well, we were looking at some other systems as well. I think that KD has uh, some, I don't know what, 
There is also Poodle, I think you said. Yeah, we found out that this one works the best for our use case. There, there are few translation tools out there. We like this one the most. Okay. So, uh, how much German is uh, SUSE and OpenSUSE? Well, we still have a big uh, German community. Uh, Oh, uh, whether SUSE GmbH exists? I believe so. Uh, I think it's a still, it is still GmbH. It's Linux Yeah. So, yeah. No. Okay, I have a mic. So, I, it, it will be, I know that uh, Doug can explain it, but uh, he doesn't have the mic, so for the recording, I will try to explain. Uh, SUSE GmbH uh, is a company that uh, is still exist and never stopped existing. Uh, it was bought by Novell. Novell was then bought by Attachmate company. Uh, these were both American. And uh, then Attachmate company was bought by uh, Microfocus, which is uh, a Britain company. And... Uh, in novel days, uh, Novel was trying to merge with SUSE. Then Microfocus decided that it would be better to run SUSE quite separately from other businesses because they had uh, multiple businesses. And uh, I think in Microfocus it's, it's still the same. SUSE is run pretty much independently of from the other parts of the company. So, yeah, it's... SUSE is still there, uh, better than ever. And uh, yeah, I think headquarters of SUSE is back to Nuremberg. So yeah, we still have plenty of Germans in SUSE. We have also plenty of other people, uh, other nationalities. And we have, uh, as an open SUSE, we have a broad community around the world. So yeah, we have, uh, hopefully, everybody can join. So we are a friendly community. OK, so any other questions? No? Then thank you for your attention. If I got you interested, try OpenSUSE. We have a booth down there. Doug is running it. We have plenty of goodies. So drop by and ask more. Thank you.